Hello, and welcome to another instalment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. On today's episode, we meet Ototo, Misaki's most trusted henchman. Ototo has a reputation for rage and brutality, but as today's story shows, he is a calculating warrior who harnesses the powers of thunder and lightning with ruthless precision. I hope you enjoy the Storm Garden. The Storm Garden by Graham Stevenson Ototo waited in the shade by the pagoda, empty-handed and content. The warm afternoon was steeped in sunlight the colour of butter, and its heat permeated the thin silk of his kimono in the most pleasant manner. His takuhatsugasa kept the sun's glare safely behind its wide brim, leaving him to survey his surroundings unimpeded. Misaki tended these gardens. He had seen her at work many times. The arrangement of flowers bordering the enclosures in a wall and pagoda had meaning, as did everything the Oyaban's daughter engaged in. Ototo was no great exponent of Hanakotoba, but he understood some of the symbolism well enough. The hibiscus and jasmine spoke of Misaki's inherent nature, and great banks of fiery orange zinnias cried out devotion to the cause of the Ten Thunders. But there were other curiosities for those with eyes to look, like the single ivory gardenia at the base of the pagoda, that she could never pass without a touch and a secret smile. Ototo saw these things because he was the calm and he was the still. He was not oblivious to his reputation within the Ten Thunders, and considered it a misconception that his brothers thought him perpetually gripped by unbridled rage. He knew anger, had known it all his life, but chose to manifest it in a different manner, and it was from here that the true roots of his name, Little Thunder, had grown. Like the thunder, Ototo's anger was stately, inexorable, and a force unto itself. He would not be moved until the time to move had arrived and once in motion he would not be denied the full execution of his wrath. His foes postured, aggrandized and preened themselves to summon courage, but in the end it made no odds. Ototo pursued them until all was laid waste. Even his weapon of choice, his Tetsubo, spoke volumes about his demeanour. At seven feet in length, and with a mass roughly half his own body weight, his fighting style had become his temperament made flesh. It was a simple matter of physics that the bigger weapon would always be slower to implement than the smaller. What his foes perpetually failed to grasp was that, as in life, it was in the spaces between the blows that the forked paths of providence were found. Ototo had become a master of movement in these spaces, where balance and foresight made the difference between the wise and the dead. He taught this to every opponent he faced, but very few ever survived the lesson. Man shapes in grey cloth set out two polished bamboo chairs in the sun before the red tile pagoda and vanished, losing themselves in the hard shadows thrown by a strong sun. No table appeared, no china, and no tea. This meeting would hold only the pretense of civility, Ototo saw from his place in the shade. Misaki's patience had finally worn thin. And rightly so. Kaminari Hanshu was a dangerously ambitious man who had never found servitude easy, even under the direct observation of the Oyoban. Earthside, he had been a lieutenant of great influence and reputation, commanding a small army of his loyal Sutaraki, warriors as aggressive and unruly as he was. There were ugly rumours on the catalyst that had sent the Lightning Lord and his strikes to Malifo. Some thought Han Shu had become unmanageable, and the Oyaban had sent him away in fear for his own command of the Ten Thunders. But this rang false to Ototo. He suspected instead that this was a test of leadership for Misaki, a test to see whether she could discern a soldier from a mad dog. From the lack of refreshments, it looked as though she had made her decision. Trufu Suma parted on the far side of the enclosure, 
the wood and paper screens opening to admit Misaki and her lieutenant to the garden. They walked side by side in silence to the pagoda and the waiting chairs. Ototo watched them approach. Although Misaki's face was calm, her stride was choppy. She was angry and working hard not to let it show. In direct contrast, the man at her side moved with an insolent grace, chin up, chest out, confident and at ease with the unfamiliar surroundings. Ototo could see how this man might be considered a threat. He had a strong, animated face, a warrior's build, and carried with him an aura of entitlement that was difficult to ignore. Rightly or wrongly, Kaminari Hanshu had been born to command. They took their seats, and without preamble, Misaki launched into the attack. I do not like your methods, she said. You are crass and bullish, and you draw far too much attention to our organization. Attention that would be better avoided. I thought my father was sending us a champion, but instead he appears to have sent me a fool. There is a fool here, Han Shu acknowledged. But it is not I. You want us to hide in the shadow of the guild, squabbling over the scraps that fall from their table. You wanted a rat, but your father is wiser than you know. He has sent you a man. He has sent me a fool, Misaki repeated. A fool, blinded by arrogance and his own insatiable ambition. Do you think the guild will stand by and let you slice up their realm like a pie? Do you think the governor-general will turn a blind eye or Lucius? Then where are they? asked Hanshu. In the three weeks since I arrived here. I have carved out a territory almost half the size of yours, without a word of protest from your mighty guild. Where will I stand in another three weeks, or another six? He smirked. This guild you fear so much is weak, nothing but creaky old men in dusty rooms counting their scrip. Creaky old men? You are even more stupid than I had feared, Misaki said. Do you think you have intimidated the Governor-General with a handful of slum protection rackets and an illegal gambling house? Do you think you can force Lucius's hand by brawling in the streets like an animal? An animal? Han Shu chuckled. Is that what I've been doing? The land on which my storm garden now stands was contested ground among five enemy factions. The Charterhouse Boys, the Brick Runners, the States the Hellhammers and the Quickeners. I crushed them all in my fist in one night. This brawling, as you put it, has sent an indelible message through the underworld of Malifaux that I am a man to be feared. Misaki shifted in her seat and resettled her skirts before continuing. Ototo could sense the restrained disgust and frustration. The Charterhouse Boys were pox-ridden drunks that could have been vanquished by a stiff breeze, she said. The brick runners and the states were at war and had been killing each other so efficiently that you need only have waited and stepped over their bodies to take their land. The hellhammers often spoke of honour, but it was always coin they worshipped. They would have happily surrendered their claim for a handful of scrip. As for the quickeners, they had some of the best sneaks and scouts in the city, and no love for the guild. They would have served your cause better as allies than corpses. She paused. You have sent a message, however. A message to the guild that you are a blundering idiot. Hanshu's face has gradually reddened through this, and his anger was evident when he spoke. Careful, girl, he warned. Being the daughter of the Oyoban will excuse only so much. Ototo floated forward at the implied threat, intending to twist Hanshu's head around until his neck snapped, but Misaki stopped him with a frown. The lieutenant was not blind to this subtle exchange and twisted in his seat, giving Ototo a fearless grin. And who is this? Your favorite pet? I have expressed my distaste for your actions, Misaki continued, ignoring the question. 
and I will say no more on it. You will follow the doctrines of the Ten Thunders as I have decreed, and you will cease this antagonistic foolishness immediately. Disobey me again, and I will have you removed. And Shu's grin widened, and he got to his feet. As you say, daughter of the Oyaban. He performed a deep, mocking bow and left. Misaki sat quite still for a time, while Ototo waited for the inevitable order. She had made her decision, he could see, and was simply turning it over in her mind to ensure there would be no unforeseen repercussions. Finally, the faint line between her brows evaporated, and he knew his time had arrived. He stepped forward. Little brother, she said, go to the storm garden. Find Kaminari Hanshu. Teach him that our way is better. Ototo had seen the arrogance and self-assurance of the man firsthand. It was unlikely he would bend before he broke. And if he refuses to learn, he asked, bury him. The storm garden was close to the river. Ototo could smell it from where he stood ripe with the effluent and detritus of ten thousand souls living in squalor. The former warehouse crouched at the end of an alley, caked in grime and lichen. There were a few soot-covered windows on the lowest two floors surrounding the doorway, and none at all in the upper three, giving the building the vague appearance of a swollen brick skull. The bricks themselves were crumbly and rotten, as though some corrosive contaminant from the river had seeped through the ground and ate into the building. Ototo remembered the tranquil sunshine of Misaki's garden and wondered what could possibly compel someone to live a life in such surroundings. He stood a short way from the entrance, motionless and infinitely patient. There was no need to crash into the building like a herd of oxen. He had already been seen by two of the Sutoraiki, who guarded the door, and one had vanished inside, presumably to report to his master. The other watched insolently from the doorway, a smirk on his face. Ototo had passed some time taking stock of the other man, watching his movements and his balance. He concluded that this man was physically strong and had some skill at arms. The Kusari Gamma wound around his middle was a difficult weapon to master, and required a measure of both discipline and innate talent. He was, however, a touch heavy-footed, and probably inclined to fight defensively, using the reach of his chain weapon to flay oncoming assailants. If it came to conflict with this man, Ototo would outweigh him. He would find the reach of the Kusari Gamma, and linger just beyond it, until the heavy-footed man was forced to move. And then, strong or no, Ototo would smash him like an egg. The Sutoraiki in the doorway seemed oblivious of his potential fate and continued to smirk, picking at his nails with a thin tanto blade from his belt. Ototo waited with the shaft of his inverted tetsubo against his chest and neck, the head of it on the dirt of the alley floor. It stood some seven feet high, a foot and a half higher than he did, which limited carrying options. Ototo found it easier to simply rest it on the ground until the time came for it to be employed. He had used the time before nightfall to clean his armour, sode, do, hayadate and saniate, all polished to a high shine. He wore no korgake, however. He preferred to fight barefoot. He found it better for judging the surfaces he stood on. Heavy weapons and slippery flooring made poor bedfellows. The second Sutoraiki returned from the interior of the gambling den, leaning close to whisper in his companion's ear. The other man's smirk grew, and Ototo understood that Hanshu, though proud, would not be shamed into a confrontation in the open. He rose to his feet, hefted the tetsubo to his shoulder, and strode into the storm garden. The Sutoraiki watched him come with wary eyes, but he looked neither right nor left and they let him pass as he knew they would. There would be a test, he presumed. Kaminari Hanshu would have heard the reputation of Little Thunder, and would wish to see for himself whether the rumours were true. 
Ototo couldn't blame him. Prowess was a fickle thing to quantify at the best of times, and a soldier as experienced as Han Shu was unlikely to dive in without first testing the water. The first floor of the gambling den was as grubby as its exterior. Bare floorboards supported nothing but a great empty expanse of abandoned factory floor. A broken crate here, a bale of withered brown straw there, and no movement other than the dark skittering of rats. There was a broad staircase to his left that hinted light and life on the floor above. Up the stairs brought him to the storm garden proper, and he was mildly surprised at the transformation. The wooden floor had been scrubbed, sanded and varnished to a deep and lustrous teak colour. The crumbling plaster walls had been hidden behind paper screens and tasteful satin and silk paintings. Chest-high glazed pots held rushes and tall sharp-bladed grasses, and the ceiling was festooned with paper lanterns glowing in lemon, ruby and gold. There were dozens of tables in here, surrounded by scruffy labourers and other working-class residents barking and cajoling around games of baccarat, sikbo, majang, pai go, kino. Girls were everywhere with ceramic cups serving sake, all of them Asians, all of them Hanshu's people. The sutoraki were there too, studying the crowd and watching him carefully. A number of heads turned at his arrival, but he passed through them without interest. The test would not be here, not in the middle of the floor, not when the scrip was rolling in so effortlessly. And it was. Ototo saw fistfuls of notes, coins, tiny oblong sticks of gold, soul stones and other less identifiable currencies circulating on the tables. This place was the proverbial gold mine. It would be good to bring this property into the fold of the Ten Thunders, once he had ousted Hanshu. Another stairwell and another floor. The noise dwindled behind him as he found the third floor to be the forehead of the brick skull. The third floor was one enormous warehouse, all the way to the iron girder roof. Their construction was alien and almost organic in their arrangement. The shadowy beams looked more like ribs than roof supports. He suspected this building had been standing here long before the coming of the breach. The floor was mostly open, but perhaps a third of the far end of the huge room had been partitioned with a warren of Fusama. There were lanterns within, warming the paper screens with orange and yellow blooms. There were shadows in there too, moving shadows. Ototo strode across the empty floor, sensing movement from black shadows that circled the living area. This was where the Sutuaki would test him, and where Hanshu would make his stand. Ototo understood this because he had done this before half a hundred times. Like a huntsman, Hanshu would flush out the beast, tear at it with his faithful dogs, bleed and weaken it, ready it for the final merciful thrust that brought death. Only Ototo was no beast. He was the thunder. A shadow to his left was the first. He heard the softest scrape of leather soles on grit and shifted his weight sweeping the Tetsubo off his shoulder in a two-handed grip. As the Sutoraki came out of the dark, Ototo saw a long glint in his right hand, Mwakizashi, and a forward-flung left. Winks of steel came at him, Juriken. To the uninitiated, they were troublesome. They caused flinching, reflexive parries and other distractions to provide an opening for the enemy. Ototo ignored them already building speed in his swing and sensing the familiar build of power. The Tetsubo began to buzz and thrum as it cut through the air. A shuriken sparked harmlessly off his chest plate, a second off his steel mask, and then he was in place, a half-step ahead of the Sutoraki, who was only now beginning his thrust with short sword. The Tetsubo struck him full force in the side of the head, and there was a blue-white flash and a boom. The Sutoraiki spun away, ragdoll slack and broken. Ototo let the momentum take him, swirling around while electricity danced the length of his tetsubo like jagged neon spiders. Half-turned, he dropped to one knee, continuing to spin on the joint as a feather-collared spear stabbed empty air where his mask had been. The tetsubo smashed the spearman's legs to kindling and spun him full circle. 
Hototo was up and leaping, using his seven-foot reach to stave in the skull of a third Sutoraiki, whose momentum had faltered at the unexpectedly early demise of the spearman. A Kusari Gama lashed out and snagged his shoulder plate. Likely the intent was to haul Ototo off balance, while his companion plunged a tanto into his unprotected armpit from the other side. Ototo dropped an inch and rooted his feet, defeating the hard yank on the chain while he crushed the chest of the tanto wielder, then heaved the other Sutoraiki to him like a man with a disobedient dog and killed him. This continued for some minutes. The bodies began piling and the Sutoraiki became wary. They circled him this way and then the other, attacking in pairs, then in clusters. But the end result was always the same. They were not unskilled. They were just not the thunder. Ototo worked his heavy tetsubo, the muscles of arms, chest, thighs, calves, singing with the effort, his skin rippling and prickling with the static discharge of the enchanted weapon as it buzzed and growled. The darkness of the warehouse flashed and glared white, throwing stark skeletal shadows of the girders across the roof at crazy angles, and each deafening impact seemed louder and more thunderous than the last. Ototo could feel the eyes of their master on him through it all, measuring, considering. And then they were done. More than half their number was dead, the thunder did not wound, and the rest slowed their circling and moved away. Their discipline was impressive. They did not seem unduly alarmed. But Ototo could sense relief in the survivors that their task was done. When Kaminari Hanshu stepped from the Fusama warren, Ototo watched him closely. He was dressed from head to foot in ornate armour, coated in shining white enamel. His Kabuto helm was anointed with two polished water buffalo horns and a Mayadate made of gold. The crest medallion showed a jagged lightning bolt. He strode into the circle of corpses with the same easy swagger Ototo had seen in the garden, and moved as though unencumbered by the heavy armour. At his hip hung an impressive daisho, katana and wakizashi, in scabbards enamelled white like the armour, but gilded in precious metals. Your name is well founded, he said his voice only slightly muffed by the helmet. Little thunder. Misaki will have your obedience, or she will have your life, Ototo replied. The helmet inclined slightly to the side. Anshu was probably smiling that arrogant smile. Do I look apt to kneel? Ototo gave no answer. Soon the posturing would be over, and Hanshu would either submit or he would fight. Had it been any other man, Ototo genuinely wouldn't have cared which, but he remembered the lieutenant's threat in the garden. He secretly hoped Hanshu would fight. A man of few words, he was saying. Well, I have words you can take back to your mistress. It takes more than a masked lackey with a club to... Ototo leapt forward, his bare feet thudding on the wooden floor, an arm's breadth from the armoured warrior. His tetsubo was still shouldered, and he made no effort to swing it. He was merely testing his opponent, and was pleased to see the other man take a startled step back. His katana flashed from its scabbard with a singing note. Well made, exquisitely balanced, white ripples dancing along the cutting edge, hinting at supernatural augmentation of some kind. And Ototo took a lazy step backward, club still shouldered. The tension unwound from Hanshu ever so slightly, but he kept the razor point of his sword aimed at Ototo's chest. A one-handed grip, he noted. Not a traditionalist, then. Hanshu's response had been telling. He was quick, very quick, with the blade, but he hadn't been expecting that bluff from Ototo. He'd been caught waxing lyrical, and no doubt his cheeks were burning inside that enamelled helmet. Enough words. Ototo said, before Hanshu could restart his monologue. Your obedience or your life. You choose. You can have my life if you can take it from me. The Lightning Lord replied, anger evident in his voice. He drew the shorter wakizashi with an inverted grip, 
holding the weapon with the blade pointed down. His remaining sutoraiki knelt in a ring, like students watching an exhibition fight in a dojo. Feeding on their master's confidence, they were smiling despite the snowdrift of corpses. Hanshu's swords rippled and sparked with some form of energy, and Ototo took a moment to examine them more closely. There was no maker's mark that he could identify, but the swords were a matching pair, crafted with obvious skill and enchanted to boot. However, like his white armour, they were pristine and mirror-bright, not a scratch on them. Unused, perhaps untried. Ototo's thunder Tetsubo, in comparison, was ugly, scarred, notched, smasher of skulls, breaker of blades. The grip was worn smooth and sweat-stained, ancient, unbowed and unbreakable. Anshu took a step to Ototo's right, and then danced left and slashed. The thunder angled away from the attack, but felt the blade skip across his spolder and split it from mid-shoulder to elbow. Sharp. There was a crackle and a hard sting like an arrow puncture, and his left arm went into spasm. So that's what it feels like, he thought as he shook off the electrical discharge and danced away from another attack. Hanshu's katana lashed at him, one, two, three, sparking against his cuirass and taking a notch out of the brim of his Takuhatsu Gasa. But Ototo was just a shade quicker, twisting away from the blade no matter which way it turned to find him. The wakizashi hovered in close to Hanshu's chest, waiting in reserve for an opening. Ototo kept an eye on it, and saw it flipping upright, then inverting again, depending on how he moved. He seeks to kill me with the offhand, he mused while my attention is on the flashing katana. He'll come in close to get around the cuirass, the armpit, the hip, the neck. He unlimbered the tetsubo, sweeping high, low, high again. Hanshu was quick on his feet and either dodged or turned the heavy club just enough with a blade to escape the impact. Whenever the tetsubo and katana met, there was a horrendous noise like a wagon of glass overturning and yellowish after images danced in Ototo's eyes from the firework bright explosions. The air stank of burning metal as they fought, and a thin grey vapour began to stream off the katana blade as it slashed and flashed. It took Ototo a moment to realise it was oil, hot oil from the new weapon boiling away as the metal heated up. Ototo felt the tip of the katana pass low beneath the haidate armour of his thigh to part cotton and flesh. A forked white spear cracked from the sword as it passed and burned a smoking black line down his leg. He did not stumble, would not stumble, and finished his half-completed swing at his opponent's chest without preamble. And Shu clearly expected more of a reaction to his landed blow and did not twist out of the way enough for Little Thunder's riposte. The shaped steel of his cuirass buckled, and the club left a broad scrape through the flawless enamel. The sparring went on, both men intent on their enemy. Ototo trapped one sword slash and dodged a second, only to have the wakizashi flash out like a lizard's tongue and score his forearm. The crackle of lightning did more harm than the thin blade, and his right hand jittered uncontrollably. He pivoted so that a disemboweling slash of the katana screeched against his cuirass instead, and brought his tetsubo around in an overhand swing, but one-handed it was too slow, and Hanshu rolled away. He stabbed the wakizashi into Ototo's calf as he went, inflicting another debilitating jolt of electricity. Ototo did not falter. The deep anger was upon him now and spun on his good leg to smash his tetsubo into Hanshu's shoulder, ripping away the protective spolder and bever for his right arm. The enamelled steel clattered across the makeshift ring, and a toto followed, letting his wounded leg drag, still holding the tetsubo one-handed. His wounded arm was strong enough, but there was no need for Hanshu to know that. Let him come in for the kill. Let him come so that I might smash him. Hanshu could not fail to see the way Little Thunder's weight had moved to his good leg. Nor could he ignore the blood spattering the wooden floor, 
from the long razor cut in his arm. He slash, slash, slashed with three quick stamping forward steps, bringing himself in close, while Ototo's Tetsubo was brandished overhead for what looked like a heavy downward blow. His katana bit deep into the steel lip of Ototo's cuirass and lodged, and he hooked the wakizashi around and up in a vicious jab to punch through the armpit and skewer lung and heart. If only Little Thunder hadn't twisted at the last instant so that the wakizashi crackled and screeched harmlessly across his vambrace. If only Ototo's Tetsubo hadn't pivoted in an unexpected two-handed grip and swung straight down and forward like a golfer's swing to smash Hanshu's knee. Hanshu screamed in agony and disbelief as the joint shattered. His leg folded backwards like an ostrich in the aftermath of the hideous crunch. The thunder Tetsubo whirled in a huge overarm arc and a dozen Suto Raiki watched as their master's helmet vanished behind an eye-watering flash and boom like a cannonball being dropped on the deck of an iron ship. When blinking partially restored their vision, they saw Kaminari Hanshu listing backwards like a falling tree, one side of his helmet crushed and concave, blood sheeting from the mouthpiece and beneath the chin guard. He hit the ground like so much scrap metal, and lay unmoving. Ototo rested the gory head of his Tetsubo on the floor and waited. The only sound was the steady dripping of his blood onto the floorboards. The Suto Raiki were stealing glances at one another, evidently deciding on what was the best course of action. They still outnumbered him a dozen or more to one, but their confidence in a victory was leaking out of them faster than their former master's brains. He saw the sea change in them, as happened in all dogs when confronted with an alpha. They were cowed. They would return to the fold and become loyal Ten Thunders men once more, and Misaki would take the storm garden to do with as she would. One got to his feet, stepped over his dead colleagues and sketched an uncertain bow. We are yours, Sundar-san, he said, eyes lingering on the blood-splattered club. Ototo shook his head, dismissing the title. Call me little brother, he said. That's it for another episode of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure.